pause. And I'll be with you for the next three hours as we present a program that marks a special event. Next week, the Metropolitan Opera's Saturday afternoon broadcast returned to CBC Radio for another season with a performance of Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin. And that broadcast will commence the 40th year of sponsorship of these weekly performances by Texaco Incorporated. It's the longest association of its kind between network and sponsor. And today, on this program, we have some of the music connected with those 40 years and some of the voices. Well, I would say that these Metropolitan Broadcasts have certainly enriched my own life, and I hope they have done the same for our listeners. It's been a great privilege for me to have been the story and stage action resume guide of these operatic masterpieces. And it has given me a feeling of emotional camaraderie with uh, our listening audience here and in Canada, as I have tried to have them hear and see in their mind's eye some of the beauty and the joy that I have experienced in these great productions. <laughs> had, I think, an Atwater Kent radio. I think it was a super heterodyne, which squealed if you didn't set it quite right. And on Saturday afternoons, there came this marvelous concert. We depended upon radio, really. It was singular, and one's imagination had free reign. <laughs> be probably around 10, 11, something like that. We weren't wealthy at all, but we had a kind of superior attitude towards the whole neighborhood. We had culture. Part of the whole feeling of being cultured was all this marvelous music was coming forth, and the whole of Saturday afternoon was spent with one's being filled with that music. Technically, the sound of that music from the overture to Carmen, as performed by the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra under Leonard Bernstein, is a far cry from the sound Canadians heard coming out of their radios when the Texaco broadcast began on the CBC in 1940, and certainly different from the first full broadcast of a Metropolitan Opera. It was in the Depression years when the only radio system that existed in Canada then, run by the Canadian National Railways, began to broadcast opera performances one hour long each from NBC. The man who introduced that first broadcast was Milton Cross. I often think back to the Christmas day in 1931 when Deems Taylor and I sat in box 44 of the Golden Horseshoe presenting Huppertings, Hansel and Gretel. Of course, uh, the impresario Gary Gazatz uh, was not enthusiastic about our broadcasting his performances he feared it would hurt the box office and attendance at the opera house. Of course, it did just the opposite. The first Saturday opera was heard the day after the Christmas performance of Hansel and Gretel, when Rosa Poncel was heard in the last two acts of Norma. The general manager of the Metropolitan Opera, who followed Giulio Gatti Casazza in 1935, Herbert Witherspoon, held his post for only several months before his untimely death. 
and the man who succeeded him had a more liberal view of the broadcasts. He was Canada's famed Edward Johnson, and he could see the possibilities of opera on radio. Ruby Mercer, author of The Tenor of His Time, a biography of Edward Johnson. Well, I know Edward Johnson thought that broadcast, bringing the opera to the people throughout the continent, as it were, was a tremendous idea and would be a tremendous thing. You know, he always had the vision of Canada being a singing nation. Well, I think he always thought also the United States and Canada being a singing continent. And of course, he being an opera singer, it should be, they should be singing opera. He would always hearken back whenever one would hear him talking any place about the times when he was in Europe and he would hear people on the street coming away from performances and humming the melodies of Verdi or Puccini. So I think that this was in the back of his mind. Now, you know, there was a period in which Edward Johnson had said that he didn't want the Metropolitan Opera broadcast to be sponsored. He wanted them to, uh, he wanted them to be free, have free access. So I think he was afraid of some sort of outside commercialism or dictation on them. And uh, so the Met was going to pay for themselves. Well, that probably led, I'm not quite sure on this subject, but that probably led to the cooperation between the Met and the Texaco, so that you have that, uh, that network which has given us the broadcasts over the years. But his heart and soul was in that particular thing, in the broadcast and in the bringing of the music and the opera to the people. He had to make a change in attitude eventually because the money just wasn't there, you know. Uh, Actually, the 15 years in which Edward Johnson was the general manager of the Metropolitan Opera were 15 of the most crucial years in the history of the Metropolitan. It was a matter of, it was touch and go. Some of Edward Johnson's reservations about the early broadcasts in the mid-30s may have had to do with how they were handled by the hosts. Here's Father Owen Lee, a professor of classics at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, in his spare time, one of Canada's most knowledgeable non-professional opera experts. Previous to Texaco, there were other sponsors. Uh, there was uh, the American Tobacco Company. They're the ones that originated your hit parade. Lambert Pharmaceuticals also sponsored uh, the Met before Texaco. And uh, once they were alerted to the various possibilities involved, RCA were sponsors. Commercials were reasonably uh, uh, discreet on those early broadcasts. Um, the annoying part was that um, people like Geraldine Farrar and Deems Taylor used to speak over the music. They would be describing the action as it was being played, and occasionally they would tell you in advance what was going to be uh, happening on the stage. And just as you'd come to the end of a beautiful um, act of Verdi, Wagner, or Mozart, uh, a voice would come over saying, uh, the curtain is now slowly descending, just what we didn't need at the time. The sponsorship of opera on radio was by 1940 well established in the minds of the public and in the minds of corporate decision makers who could see the benefits of associating art with industry. Karen King, senior vice president of Texaco Incorporated. The management of Texaco, and it used to be at that time, it was the Texas company, felt that they wanted to serve the public and they felt that by associating themselves with an organization such as the Met, which represents perhaps among the highest qualities you can possibly find in an artistic uh, organization, that they would be associating quality with quality. In 1940, one evening, my husband and I were all dressed up, gussied up, to go to an opening uh, a friend of mine was producing called Charlie's Aunt. It was revival. Geraldine Sylvain. But at 7 o'clock, the telephone rang and was a member of the, uh, the top man of the agency that handled Texaco's broadcast. And he talked to Henry. And my husband, Henry Sylvain, had always been involved in very serious music on radio, beginning with the General Motors concerts in 1933, introducing every known artist you can think of to radio. I mean, we did wonderful things, such as Menu and Inesco, the double Bach concerto, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when the telephone call came at 7 o'clock, he was there and I was stamping my feet and I said, we're going to be late, we're going to be late. He hung up finally and he said, the agency has just been informed by Texaco that they have bought the Texaco broadcast. And he said, well, Henry, what are we going to do with all those intermissions? That's what they're worried about. What happens when there's no music and nobody else knows as much about this as you do? So he hung up. And he said, I'll have to talk to Jim. 
So I telephoned my father, and I said, put on your black tie, you have to take me to the theater. And of course, the next day I realized, and because I was the only person in an office of 20 who knew anything about music, and that's it. Saturday, December 7th, 1940. Broadcasters and technicians assembled in a new broadcast studio in the Metropolitan Opera House at 39th and Broadway. A studio described in the Toronto Star that day as every Tom, Dick, and Jane's broadcast studio right in the middle of what was once the mightiest mobilization of millionaire folk ever to be seen in an opera house. The star writer, by the way, took exception to a comment by the chief NBC sound engineer who had said that through radio, quote, opera has become a rich experience in the lives of millions from Bangor to Honolulu, from Canada to the Argentine Republic. The Toronto Star man sniffed. Nice to know that for opera broadcast purposes, Canada is really on the map, even as a sort of sub-Arctic limbo. Anyway, on hand for Texaco's first broadcast, December 7th, 1940, The Marriage of Figaro, was Milton Cross. And now here's the cast. The first two voices you'll hear are the valet Figaro and the maid Susanna, Ezio Pinza and Licia Albanese, making their matrimonial plans. Then intruding on their privacy, Dr. Bartolo and his housekeeper, Marcellina. She's the one to whom Figaro owes the money. This role uh, will be sung by Ira Pettina, while the comic role of Bartolo will be sung by the Metropolitan's new basso buffo, Salvatore Bacoloni, who is making his debut this afternoon. And then we hear the page boy, Carabino, uh, sung uh, and according to custom by a soprano, in this case, the lovely Yarmila Novotna, then the Count himself in the person of John Brownlee, and finally a fussy old music master, Don Basilio, played by Alessio De Paolis. Uh, we'll have to wait until Act Two before we hear Elizabeth Rettberg impersonating the Countess. And that, I'm sure you'll agree, adds up to a truly all-star cast. Il padrone. Io per me te la dono. E la ragione? La ragione è qui. 
perché non puoi far che passi un po' qui. Perché non voglio, sei tu mio servo o no? Ma non capisco perché tanto ti spiaccia la più comoda stanza del palazzo. Perché io sono la Susanna e tu sei pazzo. Grazie, non tanti elogi. Guarda un po' se potrei assistare meglio in altro loco. Se a caso madama la notte ti chiama, madama ti chiama, ti ti, ti ti, ti due parti da quella puoi dire, e poi l'occasione, e volmi il padrone, e volmi il padrone, don don, don don, il pesante, moments of the first Metropolitan Opera broadcast sponsored by Texaco and heard on December 7th, 1940. The title role in The Marriage of Figaro was sung by Ezio Pinza and the role of Susanna by Licia Albanese. She remembers the event with Bridget Paolucci in New York. You were on the very first broadcast that Texaco ever oh, yes, sponsored. Yes. What was the feeling at the Opera House at that point? Well, I don't think that I had any feeling. I, I got used to that. But it was beautiful to be um, with Pinza, certainly the great boss of my life. And I think he was one of the great, beautiful quality of voice of basso, see? That's what I think. They were greatest, and they're still great, but quality of Pinza, really. It was in something warm. In fact, I, I tell you, I have to tell you, the last word I can say for Pinza. For me, he had a microphone in his throat when he used to come out with this tonant voice, with like this. One word, he was, and all even, this voice was really a cello, or maybe a bassoon. But anyway, it's a beautiful, um, beautiful experience to be on the Metropolitan uh, stage. With uh, all the great singers, Brownlee was there, Browning was there, uh, and then De Paul is the great uh, Comprimario. Tell me, I, so at that first broadcast great. that Texaco sponsored, at that first broadcast, um, Salvatore Baccaloni was making his oh, debut. Yes, yes, that's right, you're right, yes, yeah. And then Salvatore Baccaloni, a great friend too, and a great basso too. Basso comico, you know, comic basso. And then don't forget the great. Elizabeth, she was the countess, and she was so great, great. You know, when they gave me that part to sing, and I was Susanna, certainly, but when they gave me to sing the part of a countess in California, and even in uh, the Metropolitan, I was thinking of her all the time, Elizabeth Redberg. Really? See? The way she sang was a beauty. It was a beauty. It was a school. Still, it was a school for me. 
to hear all great artists to sing with me on the stage or when I was in the audience. It was for me all the time school. <laughs> of that 1940 broadcast of The Marriage of Figaro, North America's opera stars were becoming public figures, largely through radio. They not only were heard on Saturday afternoons, lucky newcomers also built their following by appearing on the Metropolitan Auditions of the Air, which had begun in 1937. The first winner was Thomas L. Thomas, who, according to opera historian Irving Culloden, sang a pathetically inept Silvio in Pagliacci on May the 15th. Another singer whose career was helped that way was Eleanor Stieber. In 1939, I went to Metropolitan Auditions, and by 1940, I was making my debut on the Metropolitan stage. What opera did you make your debut in? Uh, Sophie and Rosen Cavalier. And that was, of course, a marvelous um, debut role. It's really a lead, you know what I mean? And at that time, most of the um, audition winners did smaller parts to get their sort of their feet into the opera scene. But in addition, my Sophie was, uh, was a very uh, auspicious beginning. But in the meantime, in that year, I did other parts like one of the Rhine Maidens and one of the Flower Girls. And um, I think I did one c a couple of my Michaela's. But the thing was that I really got my whole training in opera on the Met stage. 
You see, I went into the Met at the same time. There was a Leonard Warren and Aretha Stevens, and later on, um, um, Robert Merrill and Richard Tucker. And um, so that I was all of that group. We were all the young Americans. And um, most of us were, had been heard and had been aired on the, on the uh, Metropolitan Auditions of the Air. And it's not so today. We were, her, uh, we were already known all over the country because of having been on the Metropolitan Auditions of the Air. One of them was a young singer who made his Metropolitan Opera debut on the Texaco broadcast of November 29th, 1941. Jan Pierce. My debut was in La Traviata. And uh, Lawrence Tibbet was the baritone and Yarmila Novotna was the violetta. To do a concert or a performance just for 3,000 people in the hall is one thing. But when you're on the air, and millions of people are your prospective audience. We don't know how many people, I mean, they have figures, but we know that they run well into the millions. Today's Metropolitan Opera stars still feel the importance of appearing on the Saturday broadcasts. Placido Domingo. I think undoubtedly, you know, that's the way to get know about around the, um, so many places than one has not even dreamed to go because, it's, you know, there is not opera houses. And I receive uh, letters from the most incredible places after a broadcast telling you thanks to that particular performance. These people said, before this performance, I, the name of Placido Domingo didn't mean anything to me. I hear this performance, and since then, you know, I have 35 complete operas of your album set. It's difficult to catch with you, but I am trying to do it, you know. And now you have a Domingo fan, and you know, you have many letters like that, and there are very... They show you, really, then the, the reason of the broadcast is really is worth it, you know. Teresa Stratus, who played Jenny in Mahagoni on the live telecast this past Tuesday. I hear from uh, very young people. I hear from children, letters from children, very old people telling me how old they are and that they can't get out anymore and uh, how they listen to the broadcast every week. And, uh, or the other extreme, a little child who said, uh, I, I, I just heard you sing Bartered Bride, and you are very, very good, Miss Stratus. Would you please send me a photograph? <laughs> and the child is something like seven years old or something. People begin to feel that they know you, and they come backstage, and they talk to you, and they tell you, I heard you on the air, you did so-and-so on the Met, Met broadcast, and, and, and they offer their opinions. And at one shot, you, you go out and you, you meet these people, and, and if it's good, they watch for you and they get to know you and some become friends. Uh, some are pen friends, they just write to you, some of them you never see. People get so close to you because of the broadcast that even they've never seen you, they, they, they debate things with you, they offer opinions, they, they tell you what they think, which is good. It's always good to know. You, you don't cut down an audience or play them short. There's always somebody who knows as much as you and sometimes even more. You mean that there were listeners who would actually suggest things about a performance? Yeah, they should. They'll either suggest or they'll ask you questions. Why did you hold this note? Or why didn't you hold this note? So-and-so held it 20 years ago. Oh, so you explained it to them. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, sure. Jan Pierce, whose Metropolitan Opera debut in 1941, was heard by millions of listeners on a Saturday Texaco broadcast. Another memorable performance was also heard that year by opera fans when on February 22nd, 1941, the Met presented Beethoven's Fidelio. The conductor was Bruno Walter, and among the cast were the performers we hear now from that broadcast in part of Act One. Marita Farrell, Kirsten Flagstad, Karl Laufkötter, Anders Rocco, Alexander Kipnis.
Wenn ich auch nicht weiß, wie und wo du auf die Welt gekommen bist, so weiß ich doch, was ich tue. Ich, ich mache dich zu meinem Tochtermann. Wirst du doch bald tun, lieber Vater. Ei, ei, oh, die Eilverlegenheit. Und nun, meine Kinder, ihr habt euch doch recht heftig lieb, nicht wahr? Aber das ist noch nicht alles. Man braucht doch noch... Hat man nicht, oh boy, mein Leben, kann man nicht ganz glücklich sein. Traurig schläft sich, oh, das Leben, mancher Bummer stellt sich ein, mancher Bummer stellt sich ein. Doch Grenzen, wenn das schon mein Finger zum Volk, da hält man das Schicksal gefangen und wacht und liebe. Das habt ihr doch voll und stille das Künste verlangen, das Künste verlangen. Und stille das Künste verlangen. Das Glück ging wie ein Ding für Volk, es ist ein schönes, schönes Ding, das Volk. Es ist ein schönes Ding, das Gold, ein schönes, schönes Ding, das Gold, das Gold. Wenn dich dich mit nicht verbindet, ist du gleich die Summe klein. Wer weiß ich, wo du nie gewöhnt bist, wird nach Tische hungrig sein, wird nach Tische hungrig sein. Drum lächle der Zufall euch gnädig und hold und segne und lenkt euer Streben, das Diebchen im Arme, das Diebchen im Arme, im Beutel das Beut, so möge er vier Jahre durchleben. Möge er vier Jahre durchleben. Das Glück ist wie ein Glück für uns Volk. Es ist ein Glück, ein Glück, ein Glück, ein Glück, ein Glück. Es ist ein Mächtig, ein Glück, ein Mächtig, ein Glück, ein Glück, ein Glück. Es ist ein Mächtig, ein Glück, ein Glück. <laughs> the great basso Alexander Kipnis singing Rock Rosaria from Act One of Beethoven's Fidelio on the Saturday broadcast of February 22nd, 1941, in which he appeared with Marita Farrell, Kirsten Flagstad, and Karl Laufketter. Performers who appear on the Texaco broadcasts, as Jan Pierce and Placido Domingo said earlier, can expect to hear from listeners by mail or in person. Texaco hears from them too. Here's Jack Sparks the president of Texaco, Canada. We do receive numerous letters, and with some frequency I hear from business associates, too. Sometimes, indeed, uh, associates who are executives of competitor companies have commented on their enjoyment of the Met on Saturday afternoons. They do not wish attribution in this case, but they have been kind enough to make such remarks. I think one of the more interesting encounters and I have very much mixed feelings about this one, <clears throat> resulted from a meeting with uh, an ex-provincial premier, and I would not mention his name at this point, but I had occasion to visit him in his office. He strode across the room, held out of his hand, and at the same time greeted me along these lines. I have an intense dislike for oil companies, particularly big oil companies, and I'm very suspicious of them. However, I suppose I dislike and have least suspicion of Texaco Canada because they sponsor the Metropolitan Opera. Texaco Canada hears from those who listen to the opera broadcasts on Saturday afternoon, and we do too. Many of you across Canada wrote to us when you heard about this special anniversary program. We thank all of you. We're only sorry that we cannot read all of the letters on this program much as we'd like to. But we do have a sampler, and to help read them, two of my colleagues have joined me. John Tennant, the host of CBC FM's Sunday program, Opera Theatre, and Margaret Pachu, who's heard weeknights hosting Listen to the Music, also on CBC FM. Jan, do you want to begin? 
Well, I have a letter from Mrs. Helen Petchy of St. John, New Brunswick. It reads in part, there was a touch and go broadcast when the New Brunswick Electric Power Commission kept failing during the Joan Sutherland, Marilyn Horn broadcast of Norma. I was driving through the Anagance Woods as the great duet approached. The power stayed on and I pulled off the highway to savor every note. Without these broadcasts, I would have been a stranger to a great art form. Margaret, you have a letter now. This one's from Mrs. Mary Ellen Burville, Burlington, Ontario. I was a very young teenager who lived on the open prairies in southern Manitoba, in a remote rural community with only six families and a population of 32. My interest in opera began in our one-room school, which had 19 pupils in nine grades. A teacher, Miss Erna Martin, had an arts and music appreciation class for this varied group of children. On a wheezy old foot-pedaled organ, Miss Martin played little snippets from the principal arias as we read through the drama. How exciting, how impossibly romantic they seemed. When I learned the operas were broadcast and could be heard on our tiny radio, I could hardly believe my good fortune. Every Saturday afternoon from then on, for the whole season, I stood because the shelf was at my ear level, and I pressed my ear against the speaker because the rest of the family did not share my enthusiasm. Here's a letter from a listener who at one time worked behind the scenes at the Metropolitan Opera, Betty McClay of Toronto. From 1928 to 1935, I was employed at the Met as a ballet girl. I was there at the very first broadcast. How quiet we all had to be. I was there to hear Lily Pons at her first rehearsals and debut. We all wept at that unbelievable voice. Even the tough orchestra stood up and wept and clapped. So many glorious as well as hilarious moments were lived through, even gaping at Einstein backstage as he and his wife visited Maria Yaritza. He was, or looked, so bewildered. Now, here's a letter from Dr. A.J. Kerwin of Toronto. I was in Peru for three years from 1937 until 1940 and used to listen regularly to the Metropolitan Broadcast by a short wave. I deeply appreciated the opportunity, so I wrote to the Metropolitan when I was in Peru. I returned to Canada in the summer of 1940 before joining the RCAF. Sometime during that year, Mrs. August Belmont spoke during an intermission in reply to my letter, though I don't imagine that she mentioned my name. Unfortunately, I, I didn't hear it. I was listening to the broadcast, but there was some trouble with the transmission. How I would like to know what she said. Margaret. Howard Brooks of Saskatoon writes, I have been listening to the Saturday afternoon Metropolitan Opera broadcast since I was a little girl. For my friends, the Saturday afternoon treat was a movie and a milkshake. For me, it was the Met. I am now a professional singer and head of voice, Department of Music at the University of Saskatchewan. I know without question that my choice of career and the part opera plays in my life was shaped in no small part by these opera broadcasts. Mrs. Harriet Thaw sends this note from Saint Laurent, Quebec. Forty years ago, when I was a teenager, I started to listen to the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts. I was so anxious to have my brother and my sister love opera as I did that I paid them five cents for every act of opera that they would sit and listen to with me. Sure enough, they both love opera to this day as a result of being exposed to those first five-cent opera acts almost 40 years ago. Henry John Giesbrecht writes, I was born in 1918 in Manitoba. I've spent many a Saturday afternoon in my woodworking shop where the wood lathe, the saws, and the hammer sort of add the, the grace notes that Verdi and Mozart left out. It's my ambition to be doing an assembly with hammer and nails when the anvil chorus is played sometime. I earn my living as a welder blacksmith. I use an anvil for real. Here's one from Barbara Ross in Toronto. I'll always remember night duty at Camp Borden Military Hospital in 1942, setting the alarm for 2 p.m. and lying luxuriously in bed and listening to the glorious music, often applauding and even conducting with a knitting needle. <laughs> Mrs. Beverly Campbell writes from Montreal, One day while listening to a Metropolitan Opera broadcast, I went into a state of shock. The opera was Samson and Delilah. Right in the middle of the marvelous aria, Mon Coeur s'ouvre à ta voix, the CBC cut it off, and on came Don Messer and his islanders. Now, I loved Charlottetown. Our daughter was born there, and I liked Don Messer, but that day I was absolutely furious. Mr. O. Amulet says, during the winter of 1942 to 43, I was an Air Force trainee in the barracks of the University of New Brunswick. Now, most of the guys decided to go into Fredericton on Saturday afternoons. I listened to the opera. Thought you might be interested in a serviceman going through a war without missing a broadcast. Well, that letter and others show the, the kind of devotion that people have to opera on radio. 
And we had interesting phone calls from you, too, from as far away as Vancouver Island. And up in Sudbury, Virginia Tomasevich not only phoned us here in Toronto with her comments on the Metropolitan Broadcasts, she followed that up by going into the local Sudbury radio station and taping her appreciation. Here's that tape that she sent us. When I was a girl in the Windsor area over 40 years ago, Saturdays in our house, we prepared for the weekend baking and ironing. My mother set a big pan of raising dough on the radiator and set up the ironing board. We listened to the Met broadcasts, and she especially loved Lily Ponds. Before these broadcasts, there was very little live opera to see, but we had a collection of thick, heavy phonograph records. When the broadcasts came, we could now be part of the living fairy tale world of opera. I sat on the floor at the foot of our tall Victor radio. It had lovely carved wooden doors and skinny legs, and I pressed my ear against the silk-covered speaker. Then the glorious voices poured into the room. It really seemed like heaven to me. My lifelong passion for opera sprouted on those Saturdays long ago. For the richness and cultural nourishment of the Met broadcasts, I'm very, very grateful. Now, here's one of those performances that Virginia Tomasevich might have heard on the February 8th, 1941 broadcast of Tristan and Isolde. The love duet ending Act One, sung that day by Kirsten Flagstad and Lawrence Melchior. Now, here's one of those performances that Virginia Tomasevich might have heard on the February 8th, 1941 broadcast of Tristan and Isolde. The love duet ending Act One, sung that day by Kirsten Flagstad and Lawrence Melchior.
the final moments of Act One of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde from the Texaco broadcast of February 8th, 1941. The singers, Kirsten Flagstad and Lawrence Melchior. The conductor was Bruno Walter, a superb musician, but according to Boris Goldovsky, a very reticent speaker. At least he was when he was approached to appear on an intermission broadcast of the 40s. I remember Bruno Walter and how hard we had to work to persuade him to talk about Tristan. I remember this was quite a trick. He refused. He said to the agency, uh, I can't talk about uh, Tristan for 15 minutes. That's ridiculous. It's too great a subject. And so, of course, they wanted him very badly because he was, you know, a great, great man. And so I asked permission to see him personally. And I brought with him one of our people who knew how to take shorthand. And we talked in general. And he told me fascinating things of how when he was a boy in Berlin, I think it was, he was forbidden to see a Wagner opera. Why? For, because his teachers felt in those days, in the 90s, that it would subvert him, that Wagner's music was improper, that it was erratic, erotic against the rules, and he was forbidden to see it. And how uh, people, there was especially one G flat in the last act of... Uh, Tristan, when the English horn plays the tune of stage, and this G flat was known as das verfluchte Guess, the cursed G flat, and how they were not supposed to listen to it for fear of being <laughs> perverted by Wagner's terrible music, and how he, of course, went on the QT and enjoyed it and loved it, and what it meant to them, and that in those days, in certain circles in Europe, Wagner was still considered to be off limits. And I said to him, but Mr. Walter, this is fascinating. Our people would love to hear something like that. Why don't you come on the air and just talk the way you did? Well, he said, you know, in conversation, all this very easy. But then if I have to do it in front of uh, I'm not used to, I said, well, it's all written down. <laughs> I said, this gentleman has been taking it shorthand. And he laughed and he said, all right. And that's what happened. He came and talked about just exactly his words, which he said to me. It's very fascinating. From the start of the broadcasts, luminaries in every field of the arts, politics, you name it, appeared on the intermission features. One of the earlier prominent figures who quickly became a star in her own right was Mrs. August Belmont, who had been a turn-of-the-century Broadway stage actress before she married the multimillionaire banker and racing stable owner August Belmont. Her acting skills were considerable. George Bernard Shaw wrote Major Barbara with her in mind, her fundraising skills were, too. She helped rescue the Metropolitan from financial disaster by forming the Metropolitan Opera Guild, and she would appeal for funds on the broadcasts and even personally pass the hat through the audience. Mrs. Belmont. Among the imperishable memories I treasure are the years I attended the opera when Arturo Toscanini conducted here at the Metropolitan. She also gave intermission talks on the great figures in music in a voice that appealed to many listeners. Toscanini, through the genius of his art, spoke to every living creature who listened. As a man, a citizen of the world, he embodied every principle we believe in. And he fought for these principles with the tenacity few men since the beginning of time have been capable of. He fought against a world which in some corners reveled in tyranny and oppression. He refused to bring his music to those areas of infestation. He used every skill God gave him to crusade for the freedom of mankind. Mrs. August Belmont died recently at the age of 100, leaving behind her a long service to opera. Another woman, still very much alive, who has served opera for half a century, is Geraldine Souvain. She took over production of the intermission features on the Saturday afternoon Metropolitan broadcasts. She is still producing them. During the war years, our first intermission was devoted to an extraordinary list of people who were allowed to speak their pieces. Masaryk, Eleanor Roosevelt, Wendell Wilkie, uh, Forrest Dahl. I could go down the line, name one important political figure or a statesman, and they were on the first intermission. Now, during the summer of 45, when the war ended, my husband said to me, well, now what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I would very much like to do. Several years ago, I went up to Casa Italiana, which is part of Columbia University and a very important organization. 
And they had revived, the Metropolitan, had revived Don Giovanni after 21 or 22 years, I've forgotten which. So the little reception was Maestro Tullio Serafin at the piano with Rosa Poncel, Pinza, etc. And they played and explained it to us because none of us had heard these operas at the Metropolitan, of course. So I said, this is what we should do on our first intermission. We must sell our opera. And he said, well, who are you going to get to do that? And how are you going to do it in 16, 17, 18 minutes? I said, we'll just try. He said, but who? And I said, do you remember when we were in Boston last year? Because then we went on tour with the Met. On the quiz was a man with a Russian name who was so brilliant. I remember he identified a horn, an obscure horn solo, and he was really full of beans. And he said, what's his name? I said, well, I'll look it up. But it turned out to be Boris Goldowski. I had just moved to Boston, and I was the head of the opera department of the New England Conservatory. And so I was written to and asked if I want to participate. And I said, yes, I think $50, $100, whatever it was, and asked to come and have lunch with them at the Ritz. I remember that distinctly. So I came to the Ritz, and here were all the celebrities, you know, everybody who was anybody in those days. Olin Downs was the quiz master. Was and Sigmund Spate there? Eh? Sig Spate, of course, yes. And so nobody paid much attention to me. I sat there, they all joked. There were all kinds of in-jokes I didn't know. Uh, Mrs. Souvain, the beautiful wife of the producer, looked down her nose at me. I was treated as it was a kind of a worm. Uh, but it was all right, you know. So, But then it was my lucky day. I knew the answers, and not only that I knew the answers, but I actually cor corrected some of the people who made wrong answers. You know, Zig Spade, who was a darling, had a trick. He would raise his hand when the question was asked whether he knew the answer or not. He f and then he would answer, and quite often he would answer something wrong. And there I was, and I would say, well, Mr. Spade, of course, you know that uh, Schumann's father was not a trumpeter, but the bookseller, and that it was Rossini's father who was a trumpeter, that kind of thing. Well, anyway, when that, when that quiz was finished, all of a sudden, I was a great hero, you see. They <laughs> discovered a new star, <laughs> a jewel that they didn't expect at all. Everybody was nice, and I was asked how often I could come to New York the next year, just like that. Yes, indeed. Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin was the first opera I heard as a child. The central character is a woman who falls in love with a man, is rejected by him, and marries another man. She remains loyal to her husband, even though she still loves the first man, who now belatedly discovers that he is in love with her after all. This plot idea, while unusual, is not by itself untheatrical. Operatic literature has quite an assortment of wives who love other men. <laughs> as a rule, it ends tragically with the woman's death, as with Isolde or Melisande. Sometimes the husband kills the unfaithful wife's lover, as in Puccini's Il Tabarro. Sometimes the husband kills both his wife and her lover, <laughs> as in Pagliacci. Faithful wives who remain faithful, even though they love another man, are extremely scarce in opera. <laughs> Prince Gremin is definitely the least formidable of all operatic husbands. <laughs> he appears in only one scene in the last act, sings a lovely aria, telling his rival how much he's in love with his own wife, and that is the first and the last we see of him. <laughs> On the surface, the plot gives the impression of following the lines of the well-known love triangle, but it is completely lacking in fireworks and bloodshed. Another intermission feature is the opera quiz. Robert Lawrence was an early panelist on it, and later in the 50s, he was quiz master for five years. He joined the panel in 1941. In those days, in the old opera house, I still call it the real opera house, the one at 39th Street and Broadway. The quiz was conducted in its early years, its earliest years, in the anteroom of one of the boxes. Later on, they put it into a special studio in the opera house, but first, in this very narrow space, 
in the anteroom, we had the panel of experts at one end, at one side, and the quiz master at the other side, and Olin Downs was the quiz master. And I remember I presumably made a clean sweep because one of the questions happened to be, name the nine Valkyries in the Valkyrie, and I think I named eight of the nine, and they liked it, so they had me back after that. <laughs> I can imagine that they liked it. <laughs> well, certainly the surroundings for the intermission features now are really quite, quite spacious. Oh, the intermission features are mounted wonderfully in the new house. They have a hall, it's called List Hall, and that is really, officially, the rehearsal room for the chorus. They meet there, and there's a very fine piano, there's a good space in the front, and where the chorus usually sits during the week and toils away, spectators from the Saturday audience come in and observe the proceedings. Mr. Downs, when did you become the quiz master? Uh, let me see, that would have been in 1958, I believe. Do the panelists receive the questions ahead of time? Uh, if we have uh, so-called discussion questions or desert island questions where it's a matter of their uh, expressing an opinion about something or making a choice. If they say, what is, if the question is, uh, what's your favorite love duet, we'll say it isn't usually as simple as that, but, or your favorite this or that, then we give them the question ahead of time because we like to have somebody be able to actually play the music and we want them to have time to, to think about it and so on. So that type of question we give them ahead of time, usually a day or so. Uh, but the ones that are spot information questions, we naturally uh, spring on them <laughs> the spur of the moment. <laughs> Mr. Downs, as quiz master, do you ever have the urge to, to be there answering the questions rather than asking them? Um, uh, why, yes, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I, I disagree with what uh, somebody on the panel says and, and feel like jumping in and uh, saying, how can you possibly say such a thing as that? Uh, but uh, usually I, tr I restrain myself because <laughs> I have the feeling that after all, the, the, uh, I'm there every time and uh, the other people are there uh, sometimes only once or twice a year. And so uh, only when I'm uh, moved beyond endurance <laughs> do I sometimes chime in with something. One popular member of the panel is Alberta Maisiello, an assistant conductor at the Metropolitan. She attributes much of her success on the intermissions to producer Geraldine Souvain. I, I don't know how to explain it, but she has a way which goes perfectly well with mine somehow because she's very honest and very sincere and very uh, outspoken. And she'll tell you, I don't think that's any good or this is marvelous or whatever. She's tremendously enthusiastic and yet she can be just, she can just um, knock you down <laughs> without even thinking about it. But uh, our um, so-called relationship has been very good throughout the years. I find it very fascinating. I was looking back at a, a 1946 Newsweek describing the Metropolitan Opera broadcast, and, and at that point they had spoken about the opera quiz as a stiff classical question and answer session. Well, it's, it's far from that now. It's a great, spontaneous, lively show. What do you do, Miss Souvain, that makes it that? At my age, my fear is becoming stale. That is the fear I live with. I want to stop, I don't want to continue. So I'm, I'm constantly experimenting. Our audience is comprised of people who know absolutely nothing about music, love it. And those who know an awful lot, professors, what's musicologists and so forth. What we try to do is put on programs that will interest as many of these people as possible. Now we know that's impossible week after week. The range of the audience in musical knowledge is too wide. But that's what we try to do. How do you um, select your, your panel so that there's a balance for these people who are musicians and these people who aren't musicians? Do you have a, a kind of formula that you follow? No. Uh, if they're not musicians, they have to love opera and go to the opera and be musical buffs, I suppose you would call it. What has Geraldine Sylvain given to the radio audience? I, I don't see how you can measure it. 
I think, first of all, the fact that she has had these intermission features, which have been a source of enlightenment to so many, many people, and not only enlightenment, but also enjoyment, certainly the quiz, but also especially opera news, for example, plus the fact that, of course, she said a couple of singers round tables that have been just absolutely hilarious and, and very good in many, many ways. Time now for our intermission feature, Opera News on the Air. Today we have a singer's round table, and our guests are four of the most gifted and talented singers, not only at the Metropolitan Opera House, but also throughout the world. We welcome with great pleasure Roberta Peters, John Alexander, Donald Graham, and James McCracken, with our Master of Ceremonies, William Livingstone, Managing Editor of Stereo Review. What are the biggest annoyances a colleague can create on a performance? Miss Peters? Upstaging. Oh, tell us about that. Uh, I was singing, not at the Met uh, for this performance, but uh, a Traviata. And in the very beginning, this uh, lady that I met during rehearsal was uh, living in this town, and she wanted to be the great star. She had costumes made specifically for herself. And as the curtain rose, we were standing together, as you know, in the beginning of Traviata, Flor and Violetta are on stage. And this lady puts her fan right in front of my face. <laughs> now, how much more upstaging do you need than that? Well, what do you do in a situation like that? I was going to ask I you I put that. it down and <laughs> stepped on her toe and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> what could you do? <laughs> Basically, I think we're a nice group. Uh, <laughs> we, we do. We help one another enormously. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything that would happen that, that to someone else on stage that I wouldn't respond somehow or other. I remember... Uh, uh, singing uh, Figaro once when uh, Judy Blaken was uh, Susanna and she was, uh, I think she was pregnant. Something wrong with her. Well, I'm sure she was pregnant. <laughs> and, uh, no, no. And she, uh, no, she... Oh, I object as a woman. <laughs> I'm sure that's what it was. <laughs> and, uh... And she was feeling very faint, and, and it was obvious that she wasn't feeling very well. So I came on singing my Signore di Fuori, you know, uh, bouncing out on stage, and I had a champagne shell. It was the only thing that was backstage with some water in, which I gave to her. Uh, she took one sip of it and threw up. <laughs> 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 now, you see, you wouldn't call that upstaging, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> I would. <laughs> She probably didn't call it very helpful. No, either. but... <laughs> Mr. Alexander? Yes, a few years ago, there's a story, and it could very well have been Donald Graham. It was a bass baritone. At the end of the opera, the bass baritone is supposed to shoot the tenor so the curtain can come down and the whole thing can come to a conclusion. And the bass baritone pulled the gun, pulled the trigger, and nothing happened. And in his desperation, he searched for a knife. There was no knife. There was no way to kill the poor tenor in order to end the opera. So the tenor had his back to him. And the bass baritone was thinking very clearly. And he went right over and he kicked him in the pants. <laughs> and the tenor fell to the floor, clutching his throat. <laughs> and as he fell to the floor, he was heard to say, it must have been a poisoned boot. <laughs> Metropolitan broadcast listeners have a double-barreled opportunity to hear their favorite singers as talkers and on stage in the operas. Many singers have appeared in the broadcasts. One who never fails to succeed in either function is Luciano Pavarotti.
Tonio's air from Act One of Donizetti's opera Le Fille de Regiment, sung by a favorite Metropolitan Opera performer and intermission guest, Luciano Pavarotti. A few moments ago, we heard some amusing examples of upstaging. There are only one kind of peril facing an opera singer, especially one who appears on a Saturday broadcast. As Stella Roman, a leading soprano of the 40s and 50s, knows too well, you only have one chance in front of your audience. And this is the responsibility, you know, uh, when you sing, you cannot correct it, you have to be good, because in a studio, you cut out that part and add a, a better uh, interpretation or vocal sound. But when you are there on the air in the theater, there's nothing that can help you, only yourself. Right, right. It must be a kind of lonely feeling. <laughs> lonely excitement, great excitement great excitement, not even lonely, I mean, it is uh, it's a warm feeling and uh, a desire to do something special. And then sometime you listen to this and, ah, you see, that note should have been better. <laughs> <laughs> Three days before the actual broadcast of The Barber Seville, Robert Merrill, I had sung The Barber Seville at the Met, you know, we did two or three performances a week of that opera. And uh, I, had made, I made a mistake, word-wise in the barber's a very difficult opera word wise there are thousands and thousands of words recitative etc now coming onto the broadcast there was one pair of spot that i was concerned because i had made a mistake i did make a mistake two days previous so i told the prompter there's a little man that sits in the box i said be careful at this phrase in the barber seville that I, I had a problem with the last performance watch me and help me now it came to this phrase and as, as fate would have it, I, I, made, I started to make the same mistake on the air for millions of people. I became very nervous. It says, when he's explaining to the Duke, to the Count, where his store is, where he visited. And the prompter started yelling the words, and finally I, he gave up in despair. You know, and I fi and for, with the help of the Lord, I came back, and, and it was, but it was a terrible thing. Now, my brother was driving, listening to it in his car, and he, he heard these mistakes, and he got so frantic, he was more nervous than I was that he, he, he drove right off the road and almost had a, a serious accident. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me something. Um, did your brother also hear the, the prompter? Well, you could hear the prompter. He was a friend of mine, and he tried to help me, but it was, uh, it, uh, after a while, he gave up in despair, and he motioned to me, oh, you, you're on your own, baby, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, he tried, you know. Uh, the prompter, as a matter of fact, on the broadcasts, you can hear occasionally. But they're not allowed to really to uh, to prompt li in, 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 with uh, you know any uh, degree of uh, uh, sound you know they they can whisper, but when you have dramatic problems and I mean problems that that are difficult and see the prompter on a Saturday broadcast, it's true you probably heard the prompter on the excerpts that we played earlier today from the very first Texaco broadcast of Figaro back in 1940, but if you missed his performance we have part of Act Four of it coming up a bit later. Prompters live in a rather strange little world in their box in the middle of the metropolitan stage. It may seem to be a cozy life in there, but not according to Joan Dorneman, who's the Met's only female prompter, as well as an assistant conductor. Broadcast days are especially trying, Joan says. Prompting on the radio, very special, very frightening. The microphones are very close to us, and we realize that while people appreciate inside views on opera, they don't appreciate it when the opera is going on. They prefer to hear the music without us. On occasion, it becomes necessary to, to use our voices more than we'd like to. But I think we all try to be extra careful about the special places, like where there, there's no orchestra or where there's perhaps a recitative accompaniment of the harpsichord or something. Wherever there's a silence in the orchestra, that leaves a space that's very easy to hear us. And we try to be very careful in those places. Of course, the singers are always a little bit more nervous for the radio broadcasts, A, because they are very important. 
to all of the performers. And we know that this is our opportunity to reach so many people. And everybody wants very much to do them especially well. But, but you're in a position, in other words, of uh, not wanting to be heard more than at any other mm -hmm. time, and yet obviously more needed than at any other time. That must mm -hmm. be a special tension for you. It is. <laughs> it's very frightening. Have you had any disasters or, or near disasters while on the air? One joke on it was on the radio. It was a replacement situation, and uh, I think it was the tenor. He thought he had finished his part in that act and went back to his dressing room. And so in the, the moment, he just didn't remember that he was supposed to walk off the stage, walk around, and come back on the other side and sing some more. And we got to that point, and I was looking on the boat for him to give him a cue, and there he wasn't. <laughs> what did you do? There's nothing you can do. The conductor just went on, and it was a very short little cue, so it really didn't matter. And I just... What happens at that moment is you try to think what next can go wrong and to prevent that. It's sort of a damning up situation. You want to be sure that the next thing that could happen won't. One thing that almost happened didn't. Thanks to the Mets' luck of having one of the world's great tenors just happened by on a broadcast day when a singer took ill, Placido Domingo. I was in the office of Mr. Bing discussing the possibility of doing the new production of Trovatore. So I was discussing in his office, and it was about 12.45 or something like that, in, the, in his office on a Saturday afternoon. And um, this particular tenor has canceled also that broadcast. And somebody else was going to sing the broadcast already. But at that moment, they arrived saying that the tenor then was going to substitute the other tenor was sick. And <laughs> so I went on and from the office of Mr. Bing I went to the dressing room to get dressed and sank the broadcast of Tosca. It was with Birgit Nilsson. It was my first broadcast, yes. Placido Domingo's presence may have saved Tosca that day, but other times singers who have taken ill have interrupted broadcasts. A number of you wrote to us mentioning the time when Aida halted abruptly when Giovanni Martinelli suddenly collapsed from food poisoning in the middle of his aria Celeste Aida. Well, moments later, Frederick Yeagle came on as Radames, and the opera continued. But the most tragic of all disasters on stage was this one, recalled by Eric McLean, the music critic of the Montreal Gazette. There have been, of course, some outstanding, stunning performances that uh, happened to coincide with the broadcast, but there are also terrible things, literally terrible, like the um, death of Leonard Warren uh, on the stage. He collapsed and the curtains were uh, pulled to. It happened on the 4th of March, 1960, in a performance of La Forza del Destino, with an all-star cast, including Richard Tucker, Renata Tibaldi, and Salvatore Bacaloni. Near the middle of Act Two, Leonard Warren fell. He died eight minutes after his collapse on stage. Rudolf Bing's words to the audience were, and I quote, This is one of the saddest nights in the history of opera. May I ask you all to rise in memory of one of our greatest performers who died in the middle of one of his greatest performances. The audience was to have only memories of great performances and broadcasts by Leonard Warren from that time on. <laughs> L'Elsa me volta, se l'arva non sei tu, chi io ti brandisca, mi sfuggi e pur ti vecchio. Esiste ancora il sole cruento. 
Voice of Leonard Warren with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra conducted by Erich Leinsdorf in music from Act One of Verdi's Macbeth. That was a studio recording of the same performers, including Leone Riesenek, who performed in the Metropolitan broadcast. There has been a controversy for years over the benefits of hearing a live performance over studio recordings. One of the concerns is the sound quality of the broadcasts. Here are some comments on this. First of all, by James Levine, music director of the Metropolitan. I find the sound quality variable, and it, it's, it relies upon so many, many elements when you're, when you're broadcasting opera. I found that's about as variable as the performance, in a way. There are times when the sound seems to have a particular vital presence to it, and other times when it doesn't, and that's not always predictable. Sometimes we can improve the quality of the technique we use or the quality of the equipment we use. But in certain respects, you'd be amazed how much it can be concerned with the sound conditions in the house that day, the temperature, the humidity, all kinds of things affect it. Also, even, the, even what, the, what materials the production is made out of affect it. It's not easy to pick up the sound of an army of singers and a full orchestra and chorus off the cuff for three or four hours on the live broadcasts where there's no chance of a retake. John Richards and Carl Berry, the engineers on the Texaco broadcasts. We have a noise problem. We, we try to eliminate as much as possible. When you say noise, what do you mean? Well, inductive, uh, inductive buzzing. Tim is operating. Noise of, uh, say, for instance, backstage setting. That's for one. How do you eliminate that noise? You can't. You can't tell stagehands, don't talk here and don't talk there when you're trying to pick up an off course mic. I mean, uh, and of course, uh, singing, trampling around the stage, we don't try to equalize the noise out. Because if you do that, you might equalize even the voice tones. In other words, we don't ride gain. We can't. I mean, we can't uh, EQ it. You see, we can work it the way we really want to. We have to satisfy the people that are interested in opera, and they want to hear the natural intonation of all the singers on stage, not falsity. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean you don't equalize the tones of a voice. Uh, we got the, the, uh, the honesty of the singer himself, you know. He's a full range, yeah. I am somebody who's never happy with the quality of sound, but that's my business, you know. Montreal-born Terry McEwen, in charge of classical records for London, he was recently appointed director of the San Francisco Opera Company. I always wanted to be better, and uh, I've been a critic a little bit with... Uh, with Texaco or with Texaco's agency uh, about the quality of sound on the Met broadcast. Uh, there are things about the quality of sound I like very much and things mostly because of the fact that uh, it's sent across the country on telephone lines that uh, could, I think, stand improving. But uh, 
it's it's good and and let's face it it gives people a chance to hear metropolitan opera performances live speaking of live versus recorded opera what are the effects of record sales following live metropolitan opera broadcast i think i can best explain explain it by telling you a story now one of the recordings we made was in 62 was a norma with joan sutherland marilyn horn uh, John Alexander and Richard Cross, conducted by Richard Bonning, which was made just after uh, the first Sutherland Horn triumphal performances of Norma in Vancouver, and where my friend Irving Gutman was running the opera house, and as a matter of fact, that's how those performances happened. And um, we recorded it. It was released on RCA. Sutherland and Horn did not sing Norma until quite a bit later at the Met, and then by then we had the recording on London that same year. Uh, Joan said to me, you know, it's a shame that uh, the record is moving on to London the year I do it on the Met broadcast because so many people will tape it from the Met broadcast that they won't buy the record and you will suffer, apart from the fact that it be had been on the market for several years on RCA. <laughs> the record went to number one on the bestsellers list immediately after the broadcast. It was extraordinary and had a gigantic effect on sales. And even though many of those opera lovers did undoubtedly tape the, uh, the broadcast performance, and they do all the time, there are more people who buy the album because they like the opera on the broadcast than don't buy the album because they taped it from the broadcast, if you know what I mean. And here's music from that London recording of Norma that went to the top, as they say. Joan Sutherland and Marilyn Horn. And I'll be with you for the next three hours as we present a program that marks a special event. Next week, the Metropolitan Opera Saturday afternoon broadcast return to CBC Radio for another season with a... And here's music from that London recording of Norma that went to the top, as they say. Joan Sutherland and Marilyn Horn.
Joan Sutherland and Marilyn Horn singing on record roles in Bellini's opera Norma that they performed live on the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts. Live, that has been the key to success for many broadcasts. James Levine. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's perhaps the very most important element. I think at the moment we're treated to a good deal of music which is canned, but it's still not the same as a straight through live performance with all of its assets and all of its flaws and all of its having to happen right before your eyes and ears. It's been difficult over the years for the Texaco company to keep broadcasting live as the stations in the United States went more and more to delayed broadcasts. Karen King, the vice president of Texaco, in charge of the broadcasts. When we found we just couldn't keep these certain stations from dropping out and for reasons which were perhaps entirely legitimate, we decided the thing to do was to try to form a network of interested radio broadcasters who would commit themselves to presenting live broadcasts for the entire season. And indeed, it's worked extremely well, I think, both for the Met and for the stations and certainly for us as sponsors. The man who set up the Texaco network was Gerard Johnson, a Nova Scotian by birth and still in charge of its operation. He keeps a tight control of it, including preemptions. We permit a, a preemption in the case of a sporting event where the station carries the full season of, we'll say, uh, the Yankees. Yeah. Uh, they carry the full season. Now, if you've got a conflict, well, we, we're not silly enough to tell the station they can't delay it and lose 140 programs. So we say you delay it. Mm -hmm. It's all right with us, but let us know in advance. There are exceptions. And, and, we, and we reserve the right to put it on another station. And we put it on another station, and then the station who is preempting us, our regular station, has to announce that for those people who prefer opera to baseball, you can tune on at XXXX at 790 on the dial and hear the opera. So your opera goer is not let down? No, no. Never? Never. In Canada, the CBC has always carried the Texaco broadcasts on all of its networks and the broadcasts on one of them are unique in North America. Dans ce mystère, nous rencontrons le prince Golo, homme déjà mûr aux cheveux gris, remarquera Mélisande. Grand amateur de chasse, apparemment. Only in Canada are the Texaco Metropolitan Opera broadcasts heard in French. This uh, uh, 40th season of continuous sponsorship by Texaco of uh, the Met broadcast we were there from the very beginning and have been there all the time since. Essentially, it's the same broadcast. Uh, we carry the opera live from the Met, as you do. And we also have uh, a quiz. We uh, have people phone in and we ask them questions, but most of the time we'll be looking after um, great artists, international artists and Canadian artists who are fluent in French. Uh, we will have, for instance, uh, either live or pre-recorded Louis Kiriko, at the Met. Louis Kiriko, combien de fois avez-vous chanté Aïda dans votre carrière? Aïda, vous pouvez figurer à peu près, je dirais à peu près, 100 représentations. Dans combien de productions différentes? Oh, ça représente euh, peut-être une quinzaine, 15 à 18 productions. Dans combien de pays? Ah là là, attendez. La Russie, le uh, part of Canada. Is there any way of measuring the popularity of your broadcast? Well, we hear about people who are uh, very much interested in these broadcasts, who have been listening in every week for years back. And I think what they appreciate more, and this, if you permit me, I would like to insist on, is uh, the fact that uh, Texaco is a very discreet sponsor. And this, it is why it is so well liked, mm -hmm. I think. I think that when big industries are going to uh, be patrons of broadcasts or televised uh, performances 
of art, they really should bear the Texaco uh, example in mind. Canadian playwright and opera buff Robertson Davies. Too much stressing of the product is offensive. You will remember who has given you a great experience, but you will resent somebody who's perpetually interrupting the experience to tell you about what they're selling. And I think that other patrons would do well to profit by that example. We're all pretty mad at Texaco right now with that 200% rise in their profits over the last year. I think they can afford to s subvention a few opera companies <laughs> that way, but you've got to admire them for the way this is being sustained, you know. Eric McLean of the Montreal Gazette. From the very beginning, and uh, they've gone right through with almost no advertising of their own on it. Discretion is the word on the commercials heard on the Texaco broadcasts and telecasts. But it's amusing to hear how the advertising agency for Texaco handled the television spots promoting the opera broadcasts. A different story indeed. They received a genuine fan letter from a cowboy somewhere in the United States who said that he liked to listen to the Met broadcast on his transistor, sitting on his horse. The only trouble, he said, is that the cows don't like opera. Well, here's what the advertising boys came up with in a television spot based on that letter. It's Saturday afternoon all over America, and millions of people are enjoying something very special. The Metropolitan Opera, broadcast live on radio. For 38 years, Texaco has been proud to bring you radio broadcasts live from the Metropolitan Opera, helping make it America's only national opera company. <laughs> Well, needless to say, opera fans on their broadcasts prefer the short, low-key Texaco identifications as read by Peter Allen today, or the late Milton Cross before him. Mr. Cross, Mr. Opera to generations, was a star in his day. That's the only word for it. And when he came to Canada to promote the 1972 season of broadcasts, he talked to Ruby Mercer. Milton, what are some of your most interesting recollections about the broadcasts? Something funny? <laughs> well, something funny if you like it. What comes to your mind? Well, in a performance of the Barber of Seville one Saturday, I said at the close of it, um, love laughs at locksmiths and old men who try to marry their young wards because um, Dr. Bartolo uh, tries to marry his Rosina. Yeah. And instead of that, of course, Rosina married her boyfriend, the Count Almaviva. Yeah. And uh, about a week after that, I had a letter from a listener in the state of Washington who said, uh, last week you said something about old fools chasing <laughs> young girls. Whom did you expect the old fools to chase? Other old fools? <laughs> well, people often tell me, Milton, that uh, they feel you're a friend who comes into their living rooms every Saturday afternoon telling them about opera, but... How do you feel about the broadcast? Do you feel that you're a friend coming into their living room? I do indeed. I think these uh, broadcasts have um, meant a lot to me. Milton, we know that you could retire if you wanted to, but, but we hope you <coughs> never will, and we hope you will continue forever and ever being the voice of the Metropolitan Opera broadcast. Well, I enjoy it very, very much. It's been one of the great joys of my life. I would say. Well, you give joy to millions of people doing it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. Some of Milton Cross's admirers were professional broadcasters. A number of years ago, one of Canada's top narrators and actors, Henry Raymer, used to sit in a broadcast booth in Montreal and do the Canadian cut-ins, as we call them. And from hearing Milton Cross so often, he became an admirer of his style of broadcasting. Milton was a master of pace. And he would take what I would think would take an ordinary, a skillful reader would take a minute. He could do it in 30 seconds and give you the illusion that it, uh, it was a two-minute romp. He would take a word and savor it and then go through the next 45 seconds in one gulp. And uh, in doing the host today, I've tried to get a sense of that unbelievable ease of pace. He would also commit to the language. He loved the sounds of Italian and French, and he rolled the R's, and he was 
And it, it's an incredible virtuoso of opera speech. I've never heard anyone since that has matched him. In another studio at CBC Montreal, another announcer would also sit and listen to Milton Cross on headphones. On Saturday, January the 4th, 1975, the French-Canadian host of the Metropolitan Broadcast, Raymond Charette, stood by for Milton Cross to introduce that day's performance of L'Italiana in Algeria. I was just waiting for two o'clock to strike, and the first voice I would hear normally would be the voice of Mr. Cross saying, good afternoon, opera lovers. And uh, that time, that day, I heard um, the voice of a lady who said, we have lost a friend. And I didn't know he had died the day before. Uh, I almost fell off my chair, and uh, I couldn't find the words to uh, translate the information to our uh, listeners because uh, Mr. Cross was uh, not only well known in the States and in uh, English speaking Canada, he was very well known throughout the French network too because uh, people would uh, switch from the French net to the English net and get to know Mr. Cross mm -hmm. very well. The best word that was used, the outstanding word that was used at the services for him was modest. His successor was the present host, Toronto-born Peter Allen. He was a very modest man. Here he was, this great figure in the history of opera, really. Uh, apart from actual performers and impresarios, he was an outstanding figure in the development of opera and the spread of the liking of opera all over the United States and, I guess, the Western Hemisphere. But he never indicated any kind of pretentiousness. He was very modest in his dealings with everybody and on the air, and he just went his way, and it, it was an outstanding thing to know a person like that. You know, show business and radio and theater and opera are full of flamboyant personalities, and he was quite the opposite. He had, as I said and as everybody knows, a tremendous reputation, but never acted as if he did. Well, that first broadcast must have been a very difficult thing to do. Well, it was a terrible kind of thing to have to do to to replace this man who was, as I say, such a loved and modest figure. Apart from the fact that you know, if he had just been on vacation, it would have been a terrible assignment to face. But uh, it went off. What was the listener response to your first few broadcasts? Very cordial. I, I, the mail I had was almost entirely friendly and flattering, and uh, I have had one or two unhappy letters, but uh, I've, I feel pretty good about the batting average. I, I feel uh, there are people who don't like anybody, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the general reaction. Milton Cross was always associated with the radio broadcasts of the Metropolitan. In recent years, Texaco has brought opera to television viewers as well. In 1972, for instance, they presented highlights of the gala evening at the Metropolitan Opera House on April 22, 1972. It was a tribute to the Metropolitan's Rudolf Bing and many stars of the Met who had appeared in operas and Met broadcasts during his tenure performed for the cameras. Among them were Richard Tucker and Robert Merrill. They sang for the cameras and the audience in the opera house in Vano Alvaro from La Forza del Destino. Sangue 
scherno ah, ah, ah. Ora me come isorrarti La vigliata non hai cuore Di quel sacro al disonore Robert Merrill and Richard Tucker, as they sang In Vano Alvaro from La Forza del Destino in 1972. Well, people all over this continent who might never have learned to love opera do so. At home, they're pretty tolerant, but at school, you get all kinds of, oh, you listen to opera, do you? You know what I mean? It's a real put down at school, but I still like it, you know? A young member of the Canadian Children's Opera Chorus, whose love of opera has already led her to singing professionally. A number of Canadian opera singers, both aspiring and well-established, have gained by listening to the Metropolitan Broadcasts. Canadian bass Peter Van Ginkle studied in Montreal in the late 50s. I never wanted to miss anything from the Met. Since I was a student at that time, whatever I had to do, uh, I was always trying to get into my car quickly and, <laughs> and turn on the car radio, you know. Uh, very often I, I did have a score next to me, but uh, that I would, if, if there was something special, I would ha I stopped the car and, and, and follow it then for, an, <laughs> for about five or ten minutes. You know? It was, um, for me, very important to know how these people uh, approach the, the different characters. Theresa Stratus recalls her student days in Toronto before her own Metropolitan debut at the age of 19. Because I came from a family that knew nothing about opera, therefore I knew nothing about opera at the age of 16, I was way behind the other kids who had been perhaps raised on chamber music or whatever else. Uh, I was raised on buzuki music. So when we used to get to the intermission part of the broadcast with my score, I used to sit and listen with my score to the broadcast. In the beginning, I tried to listen and realized I wasn't really understanding anything of what was being discussed, and it scared me. Therefore, I turned off. Uh, and what I'm saying is that perhaps I hope that some young people out there, or whatever age, perhaps they feel somehow this same thing of, well, I'm not going to understand this. And uh, it took me a while to be able to sit and listen to the intermissions, which I then found were very, very interesting, and I learned a lot and also very often amusing. One such intermission from the Met broadcast of February 4th, 1978, provides direct advice for young would-be professionals. Richard Moore in conversation with soprano Zinka Milinov. I personally think that a singer uh, should be ready when, when they go out, you know, and that means at least four or five years of studying. Yes. Uh, because first is the vo voice has to be placed in case that they, because they have some natural placement of the voices, most of uh, good voices, they have natural placement, but there always is something to be worked on it, you know, and then there comes the repertory, the phrasing, the, 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 the molding, the phrasing. And the language. And the language, naturally, and the language is very important. You can tell the results of that study by listening to your recording of the beginning of O Patria Mia from Verdi's Aida. And I want everybody to take special notice of this fantastic pianissimo attack and the crescendo on that opening phrase.
Zinka Milinov on the intermission broadcast of February 4th, 1978. Ruby Mercer has been particularly aware of such metropolitan broadcast effects on singers in isolated communities. I was on tour with the Canadian Opera Company one time, just for one season. We went to all of these smaller places in the northern part of Canada, and we went up to Alaska. But the people there wanted opera. And why did they want opera? Because they had listened to opera on the Metropolitan Opera broadcast, and they wanted to have something locally that they could be proud of and that would uh, some way or other not compare, but uh, give their local people a chance not only to perform but to hear. One such community is Dawson Creek in northern British Columbia, where Mrs. Rotroud Lupp writes to say that she's conducted the Dawson Creek Symphonet and Choir for 10 years now. She writes that her group's love and knowledge of opera would never have developed but for the Metropolitan Broadcast. I'm Bridget Paolucci in New York. The impact of the broadcasts on singers and other performers is obvious, but those Saturday matinees have also influenced many others. For instance, I've become a lecturer, writer, and broadcaster whose specialty is opera. But most of all, those broadcasts have had an impact on the Met itself. I discovered that when I talked to Anthony Bliss, executive director of the Metropolitan Opera Association. We get contributions, and I don't think we would be getting them if it wasn't for the broadcast, from over 150,000 people in the United States, all provinces of Canada, and from Mexico, and some from South America. And that is all the cumulative effect of the broadcast. I think many of the small, smaller companies, the regional companies that have developed in the last 15 years uh, could not have developed if it hadn't been for the broadcast over the years that really developed audiences all over the country. The presence of these broadcasts over the years has been an overwhelmingly important force in the whole growth of opera in this part of the world. James Levine, music director of the Metropolitan. Just as with radio, just as with the long playing record, the impact of television is enormous. But so far, films have not suffered because of television. Radio doesn't seem to be suffering as a result of television. And I think that's very encouraging. Do you see the broadcast continuing then? Oh, yes. I would certainly hope so. Ultimately, that'll be up to Texaco, I suppose, because after all, they they're responsible for the sponsorship, but as far as we're concerned, we hope the broadcasts go on forever. Karen King of Texaco. Radio broadcasts, by and large, are quite satisfying to the audience, but they certainly enjoy seeing a few operas on television. For instance, the opening night of the opera this year was televised for the first time in 25 years. For a few what I would call events, perhaps three, not more than four, uh, operas a season. I think television is a great added dimension, and I think they need to be events. The telecast of Otello on September the 24th this year marked the opening of the new opera season. Placido Domingo was Otello, and Diago was played by the fine U.S. singer Cheryl Milnes. Here they are singing the dramatic final moments of Act Two of Otello.
Placido Domingo as Otello, Cheryl Milnes as Iago, in the final moments of Act Two of Otello, the roles they played on this season's Metropolitan Opera opening night, September 24th, televised live by Texaco. With increased attention paid to televised opera with its technological developments, what effect, if any, will this have on the audiences for radio? And in fact, on the future of the Saturday weekly broadcast during the Metropolitan Opera season? Karen King, senior vice president of Texaco, whose duties include supervising the broadcasts. The public interest, as evinced by almost any kind of measurement you'd care to make, uh, has grown tremendously. And we know that on any Saturday afternoon, we will have a hard core of three to five million people are going to listen to that broadcast. As an opera buff, I have heard many other opera buffs say, oh, maybe with all this interest in television, Texaco will cut down on the number of Metropolitan Opera radio broadcasts. Is that rumor, possibility, fact, Mr. King? We have no intention of cutting down on the number of our radio broadcasts. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Jack Sparks, president of Texaco Canada, no, I have never heard anyone of my associates or my predecessors make any comment that suggested that Texaco should discontinue its association with the Met. We have absolutely no intention to sever our relationship, our sponsorship of the Met broadcasts. I think that a number of other things would go by the way. We certainly hope that circumstances will permit us to continue this as long as such broadcasts are available and are of interest to the listening public. The cast includes Raina Kabavanska, Yuri Mazarok, and Nikolai Gedda. And it all began on December the 7th, 1940, as Milton Cross introduced the Saturday afternoon opera audience to Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro, with a cast including Ezio Pinza, Licci Albanese, Lisbeth Rettberg, and Salvatore Bacaloni. And then later, Susanna, Licci Albanese, sings a lovely aria, Le Vieni Non Tarda. The lights of the opera house had been lowered, the footlights were flashing against the beautiful new gold curtain, which means that the Pinza is on his way to the orchestra pit. the exciting final moments of the broadcast of December 7, 1940.
the significance of the broadcasts was enormous and uh, impossible to calculate, really, because no one person, I think, could have any idea of how widespread they were or what kind of people they reached. But I knew some of the people that they reached. Just about the time of that historic first broadcast, author and playwright Robert... That's our program, marking the 40th anniversary of the Metropolitan Opera Broadcasts, sponsored by Texaco and presented on CBC Radio, which next week begin their new season. And we'd like to thank Texaco for their cooperation in presenting today's highlights of those 40 years, especially Dan Presley and Tony Philpot of Texaco, Canada. Others involved were our coordinator in New York, David Scrivens, interviewer, Bridget Paolucci, consultants, Warren Wilson and Margaret Ireland, also, Percy Tallman, Cindy Bissayon, Michael Bronson of the Metropolitan Opera, and the Metropolitan Opera Association. For producer Doug McDonald, I'm Bill Hawes, leaving you with Leonard Bernstein conducting the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra in the familiar overture to Carmen. <laughs>